Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, hello and welcome to our seminar. Um, I think some people are still trying to join us, but we will start and then maybe they will uh, catch up. My name is Katarin Stefan. I am the head of the research group Innovas on Wanacha Capital Recharge at the TU Dresden in Germany, and I will be your host for about one hour today, together with my colleague, um, Jana Glass, who is going to uh, be the speaker of the webinar. And um, I welcome all of you. A few um, information, maybe um, some, some notes for you. The, the seminar is going to be recorded and shared also on our website. And if you are not comfortable with that, um, you might still uh, join us. Perhaps you may want to uh, change your name into like an N or something, so you will not be recognized. Your names will not be seen during the seminar, perhaps in, in the comments in, in the discussion sessions. So it's up to you. We, of course, we would like to, to have everybody on board. Um, cameras and microphones are turned off. We are kindly asking you to post your questions in the chat during the talk. So we will collect all the questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. For the um, series of online seminars, we have been choosing uh, today um, the first topic, which is part of our smart control project, a water GPI funded project in collaboration with partners from Germany, France, Brazil, and, and Cyprus. And the presentation has been prepared in collaboration with our partner, Christoph Sprenger. I think he's, Christoph is also in the room and also with contributions from uh, Ron John Heim. And um, we will give a short introduction into uh, project. What is the scope of the project and the uh, objective of the talk today. Jana will present to you two simulation tools that have been developed in the smart control project. And at the end, we will have a quick Q&A question. We, we estimate that the entire seminar will take about one hour. So feel free to, to post the questions as we talk. So, so I, will, I will collect them and uh, move to, to Jana for, for uh, discussions. Um, so I, I, I saw the list of participants and I, I assume that everybody is well familiar with Manachaki for recharge, but still maybe to refresh our memories. And for those who are not working with Mar directly, what is it actually managed aquifer recharge? Some of you might, might be familiar with the term artificial recharge, which comes maybe in the contrast to the word natural aquifer recharge, natural groundwater recharge. So what, what, what we understand basically on the managed aquifer recharge or MAR as abbreviation is a storing surface water underground yeah? for, for various reasons. We, we do that for um, seasonal or long-term purposes. So we store water either for using it in the, in the dry season or maybe for, we leave it in the aquifer for longer time to serve maybe ecological purposes. We use MAR, to prevent salt water intrusion in coastal aquifers, to increase the capacity of drinking water production wells to, for water reclamation. So water percolation through the soil layers will also improve the quality and so on. There are two examples here um, that I've been choosing today for you. One is um, one type of technique, which is the recharge ponds or recharge basins, you see the water is percolating slowly downwards um, and then it's being abstracted from a well or, or a well filled most of the time surrounding the basin. So, so everything is, is kept at the, in the control conditions and uh, water can come from different sources, rivers, the treated wastewater <clears throat> runoff and, and so on. Second technique is mostly um, applied in confined aquifers where we have um, a bit deeper water, groundwater levels, and then 
we inject water directly into the aquifer. There are pros and cons for both techniques. Uh, we're not going to go into too much details. I think most of you are already familiar with that. I want to say that the uh, application of MAR has been done success, success, successfully in, in uh, many countries worldwide. We have two um, important reviews that show us the efficiency of Mars system. One that was coordinated by our partner and friend Christoph Sprenger with an overview of Mars in Europe. And um, we expanded from that and um, built a um, inventory of, of Mars projects all over the world. And we have evidence from more than 60 countries where these practices are well documented. And the reasons we do MAR, as mentioned also earlier, it's different from maybe from country to country or from continent to continent. You see um, applications in um, countries where they foc the focus is more on agriculture, mostly on South America and Asia. We see applications in Africa and Europe where the focus is more on drinking water supply and domestic use. Well, let's say in the um, North America or Australia, the focus is mixed between domestic use, agriculture, ecological reasons, and, and even some industrial applications as well. So th there is a lot of um, evidence that the technique can be uh, very useful when applied properly. But we also, of course, get a lot of questions where it, whether it is it safe or not to store water in the aquifers. And um, we, of course, we need, to, we need to answer that question by the um, legislation now that we have in place. And uh, from the European perspective, I apologize for those of you outside Europe that this slide is more focusing on the European legislation framework. We have um, most of our water um, management it's guided by the European Water Framework Directive, which is recognizing the MAR, the, the term there is artificial recharge. It's recognized as, as one management tool that the EU member states can use in order to achieve a good groundwater status, which is the, the goal of, of course of this directive. But, and there is a but in there, um, control mechanism mechanism need to be put in place in order to eliminate the chance of, of degradation of the status. Yeah, so we can use the tool, but we need to make sure that we have the proper instruments to avoid um, degradation of, of the groundwater status. So in this case, the focus is on the groundwater body as a recipient. And uh, since two years, we have the new drinking water directive, which is now, um, aiming at um, imposing that all the water extraction sites or water exploitation sites conduct the risk assessment and risk management at the catchment area. And this are, has to be done until 2027, uh, the latest. So even the earliest, of course, the earlier, the, the best, the, the better. So we are bound by the water framework directive saying that the groundwater status cannot be deteriorated. And also we will have to perform risk assessment studies for all the water abstraction sites. But now the, the word risk was coming up a few times on this slide. So what are actually the risks that are associated with MAR? And I, now I, I um, a link to a, a paper published by colleagues from, from Munich who um, under the coordination of Anemic, they they review the potential risks associated with MAR and group, group those risks in several categories. So we have human health risks, of course, which are the most um, concerned ones, uh, both by the, um, say, authorities and, and, and population alike. This referred to mostly transfer of pathogens from the surface water into the groundwater and also from the groundwater alongside the flow path direction to the extraction points. So are these pathogens creating an additional risk to the consumer? Because we 
might have control of the quality of the infiltration water, but we don't know. It's very difficult to control the behavior of those contaminants underground during the, 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 the transport percolation and also transport, horizontal transport. Environmental risks, they refer, um, and ecological risks also refer in, in line to the European Framework Directive to the deterioration of the water body by different types of contaminants. So we might not talk just about the microbiological contamination, but also some organic and inorganic contamination that might potentially appear during or in connection to managed aquifer recharge. Technical risks refer to very often operational um, issues occurring during Mars. So let's say clogging of the infiltration um, structures, um, maybe technical failure due to um, poor planning or insufficient understanding of the, of the aquifer properties, maybe um, insufficient recovery rate or let's say um, underestimated recovery rate or not, not all the water that is injected can be also recovered and so on. And the social and economic risks, of course, we, we, we might have a wide range of, of criteria from um, lack of acceptance by the communities, high costs if the system is not designed and planned properly. And um, of course, um, maybe difficulties to get permission because we might not be able to, to show that the technique is risk-free. And um, in line with the legislative frameworks that we might also have risks that in, in, in many countries, there are no dedicated guidelines and, and legislation for MAR. So what we do for those um, to, to address these risks, um, two, three years ago, we, we started a new project um, aiming at um, reducing those risks associated with MAR through the development of a, a system composed of two components. One is the real-time monitoring to get more information from our MAR sites. And the second component is a, <clears throat> a toolbox consisting of risk assessment and management simulation tools. We have partners from um, uh, France, Germany, uh, Cyprus, and, and Brazil. And this was a project funded under the water, uh, water programming initiative of the European Commission. The, um, the project is based on these two pillars. As I, as I said, the increase of, um, of or enhancing the monitoring systems at the, at the MARS sites. So we need basically more data. In order to know our risks, we need to produce more data. But the, the data al alone is not always useful. And we need, we need information from this data. And uh, to extract information, we need proper uh, instruments, proper tools. So we design a set of, um, of tools that are all working web-based. So they facilitate collaboration between partners and then between, let's say, authorities and, and operators of Mars systems. And these tools aim at providing uh, initial risk assessment of the uh, Mars site, even before it was planned, or let, let's say in the early phases of, of the development, we have a set of tools um, aimed at advanced monitoring. So, so we, we get information out of our data. And, and sometimes even information is not enough, we need knowledge in order to take the, the right decision. So we have also modeling tools and, and uh, numerical simulation tools for transforming the information into, into uh, knowledge. These tools um, are demonstrated at six case studies um, from Dresden, Berlin, uh, Ezusa, and Cyprus, in two cases in Northern Brazil. And we analyze also the value of the information, the economic value of the information that the operators get through the utilization of these tools. Yeah, so we want to know if the additional information and the additional knowledge that we provide is really um, can be transformed into economic gain in addition to the risk reduction and uh, management. 
We also provide some training. This, this seminar is part of, the, of that part. And, and also we're looking at other sites that might benefit of this uh, concept. Now, um, I mentioned the web-based implementation at the um, Teo Dresden and the, my group, we are developing a web-based modeling platform. Some of you might, might have heard about it. We have tools that are covering, let's say the entire catchment, the, um, from, from the abstraction to the final use, so, such as, for example, the mod flow based numerical grammar modeling tool, which is a uh, mod flow 2005 based um, web based interface. We can run um, simulations and, and analyze scenarios based on the outcomes of the mod flow um, models. We can also connect those mod flow models with sensors that are installed at the sites and get data from the sensors fed into the models in real time. And then the models are being basically updated in, in near real time conditions. This will be the subject of future uh, seminars. And also for, for the entire mass site, we can um, assess or, or estimate the, the risks associated with MAR through a quantitative microbial uh, risk analysis, which is going to be presented today by Jana. But we also focus on some smaller um, components or smaller aspects of MAR, for example, in the um, injection abstraction part, where we try to assess the the hydraulic residence time, also a tool that is going to be presented today. So these two are part of the seminar and additional tools might cover the design of uh, infiltration ponds. We have um, tools that estimate the, the mounting or the impact of, of MAR on the groundwater level under the infiltration site. We have a set of tools that um, can be used for assessing the salt water intrusion in coastal aquifers based on a couple of analytical equations, but also on, on numerical uh, code uh, software using the CWAT package for MATFLOW. And this toolbox um, is now available online at, at our website. And in the smart control project, we are going to present to you two of these tools that have been applied at one of the case studies of the project. So now I hand over to Jana for the rest of the seminar. And again, I encourage you to use the chat if you have questions or comments or suggestions during the, during the, the meeting. Thank you, Katalin. So I will now present um, the one case study site in the smart control project. Um, this is Ben Spandau. Um, it's a, a MAR site where water from the from the Havel River um, is abstracted and pretreated in a surface water treatment plant and then delineated to natural wetlands as well as infiltration basins. Um, after the subsurface passage, um, the water is extracted via a well field, and after post treatment, it's um, delineated to the public water supply. So the final water use is drinking water. And the main objective um, is to increase the capacity of the municipal waterworks in Berlin and sustain the urban ecosystem present as as the wetland and trench system in the Berlin Spandau area. And the challenges that we addressed at that site was the real time monitoring of subsurface residence time and the high resolution microbial dynamics. Um, at each case study site, we assess the risk according to the Australian guidelines. So we assess two categories the human health risk as well as the environmental risk at the end point. We regarded a list of potential hazards, so from pathogens to inorganic chemicals, salinity, nutrients to organic chemicals, and classified the risk in low, medium, and high. And we found out that the most relevant risks were related to pathogens for the human health as well as to nutrients. Um, 
for the environment. As pathogens can lead to illness, um, we further regarded the health risk, and those are mainly associated with the underground travel time between the infiltration basin as well as the extraction well. Um, to have a deeper look, we applied the groundwater residence time tool, which is based on temperature time series to determine the hydraulic residence time and the quantitative microbial risk assessment tool to determine the pathogen removal by the underground passage. And first, let's have a look at the groundwater residence time. So the passage distance between the infiltration point and the abstraction point only is only a simplification and doesn't account for the soil and hydraulic conductivity of the under, underground of the subsurface, which is important for the removal efficiency. And a better proxy is the time that the water takes for the underground passage. So also called the groundwater residence time. Um, that can be measured either by a tracer substance, which can be um, infiltrated in the infiltration point and also measured then at the extraction point. But as um, the whole system is for drinking water purposes and um, it's always in operation, it's easier to use their um, environmental tracer. So we used heat as a tracer and measured the temperature at the infiltration and abstraction points. Um, heat transport, the, most of the work is based on the equation from Stallman, which is a 1D analytical solution for temperature transport in the aquifer. It assumes a sinusoidal input, um, which is present at Berlin because of the seasonal temperature changes between summer and winter months. Um, it also assumes uh, steady state conditions and that the soil properties and the water and soil temperature are uniformly distributed. As you can see in the right, um, that is the, the red line is the input and temperature signal, and that is attenuated below detection level limit in about 200 meters from the infiltration point. So the Infiltration and abstraction locations cannot be further than 200 meter in the case of um, Berlin. And here you can see um, example temperature measurements for the basin, and um, for the input signal, for the infiltration water temperatures. And you can see that it fluctuates between three degrees in, in winter, to up to 22 degrees in summer, which results in, a, in the abstraction well in, in temperatures between 10 and 15 degrees. And as you can see, um, the temperature signal was able to be, um, to be fit to a sinusoidal function, at least in, in parts of the time period. Um, so in the groundwater residence time tool, we have a look at the maximum and minimum temperatures in the infiltration water as well as in the groundwater or um, abstraction water and at the turning points of the uh, sinusoidal function. Um, the, the tool is based um, on temperature time series. So you need a regular temperature measurements at least for one year. And those needs previously be uploaded in the tool T10 real-time monitoring. And um, if you're interested how to do that, um, in one month, there is another online seminar organized by us where we present the real-time monitoring tool and where you can see how historical and real-time data can be integrated there. So that data can be reused in the 
groundwater residence time tool. So you um, choose the project in T10 and as well as the sensor for the input and the sensor for the abstraction location. Parameters that need to be defined as well are the thermal retardation factor as well as the tolerance. As a result, you receive um, graphical output. So you can see the fitted sinusoidal curves, including the turning points and the max and minimum of the fitted curves for the infiltration surface water and the groundwater. And the results are immediately available. At the moment, um, you can see here the results of historical time series. But if real-time data is available of a period of at least one year, it can be also calculated with recent um, data. There's also TEPNIA output available um, where you can find the thermal and hydraulic residence time. So here you can see the thermal residence time is about 50 days and the hydraulic residence time is about 30 days for that example. So you can calculate if your um, the groundwater residence time, for example, complies with regulations. Um, yeah. To sum up, groundwater residence time is a good proxy for the removal efficiency of many pollutants, including pathogens. And temperature measurements and the heat transport model can be used to assess the residence time and support to comply with regulation. For example, the minimum 50-day residence time that is applied in Germany. The tool T19 was implemented on the Innovas platform. It can be accessed um, for free after user registration. And it has been proven to work well for the Berlin case. The residence time, which are calculated, can be then used also for the lock to calculate the lock removal values for pathogens, which is required for the quantitative microbial risk assessment, which I come to right now. Um, to evaluate the risk caused by pathogenic microorganism, a quantitative microbial risk assessment can be conducted. It's also done to support the decision-making process related to the microbial safety of Mars systems. Um, it represents the probability of exposure to pathogens and the health effect of that exposure. It's not really a safe versus unsafe um, view, but rather it works with first case assumptions and probabilities. So for example, how sure are you that the inhabitants of Berlin are not harmed by the microbial contamination by drinking water consumption? One WHO definition of not harmed is that the additional microbial risk is below one micro daily per day. So what is daily? Um, it's the disability adjusted life year, and it's a measure of the overall disease burden expressed as the number of years lost due to ill health, disability, or early death. And it's calculated by the sum of years of life lost due to dying early and the years lost due to disability. And one daily therefore represents um, one year of healthy life lost. Um, and the measure smaller than one micro daily uh, means that less than one virus is present in 1000 liters um, of water, to give an example. Um, the risk assessment um, is normally done in four steps. So first you have the hazard identification or problem definition, where the scope and purpose of the risk assessment are carefully defined. Then you have the exposure assessment, 
to quantify the magnitude and frequency of exposure to reference pathogens and we are the defined exposure pathways in hazardous events. So it's the pathogen characterization and the occurrence of the pathogen in the environment. Then you have the health effect assessment. So their data is compiled for each reference pathogen and in, includes those response relationships and any subsequent health outcomes might it be as well as their severity or disease burden estimates, such as the daily I just represented to you. As a fourth step, there is the risk characterization to quantify the microbial risk levels. There, the exposure and health effects information is combined by calculating the risk for the defined conditions and scenarios. And it integrates the results of the exposure assessment and hazard characterization for an assessment of the probability of a harmful effect, as well as the assessment of uncertainties. Um, let's come to the Kuma R tool. So it helps to quantify the pathogen occurrence in source water and their removal by various treatment steps at MAR facilities. Um, the QMR modeling approach applies a stochastic Monte Carlo simulation process and is based on an R package developed by KWB. And the interface was developed within the smart control project on the Innovas platform. So first, the simulated pathogens are defined as well as the stochastic parameters. Then the inflow data and the random samples are gen generated. The log reduction for each treatment processes are applied uh, depending on the kind of treatment. So it could be primary, secondary treatment or tertiary treatment, as well as the soil aquifer passage. Then the infection risk for the end user due to exposed volume is determined and in the end, the health risk can be assessed. Let's see how it looks like on the Innovas platform, the tool. So first of all, specific bacteria, protozoa or virus can be added to the analysis um, and turned on and off. Here's the add pathogen button. And then from a list of um, viruses, pathogens, uh, viruses, protozoa and bacteria, um, they can be selected. They can also be turned on like E. coli or turned off like the other um, pathogens. Um, for each, each pathogen, a number of literature default values are available, reducing the number of required parameters. Um, Mostly the database of the Kum R wiki is in the background. Um, there are um, standard parameters for the probability density function, as well as for the dose response relationships and the health parameters can be imported. And so the number of required parameters is really reduced. And to find further information, always the link of or the reference of the given um, source is also given um, where you can find further information. As a next step, the treatment steps are selected. There are over 25 possible treatment steps grouped into coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation filtration, natural attenuation, pretreatment, disinfection, primary and secondary treatment. And for each of the treatment step, a probability density function must be um, selected. So here you can see how the various probably probability density functions look like. So they distribute the value differently depending if it's a uniform, a log 10 uniform, a normal, a log 10 normal distribution. 
besides the probability density function for each um, pathogen group and treatment step, the minimum and maximum log reduction value needs to be given. And, and a treatment train can be applied. So not only one treatment step can be set, but also various treatment steps um, after each other. So for example, first primary treatment and secondary treatment, aquifer passage, and then here as last time, chlorine treatment are applied. And then the exposure scenario, there are the events per year, as well as the ingested volume per event are defined for each exposure scenario. And then comes the important step to define the dose response relationship. As uh, I said earlier, their um, literature, literature um, dose response models are integrated from the Kuma R wiki, which um, gathers um, a database on or which is a database on Kumar A. Um, but also if you have your own dose response relationship, um, the specific values can be typed in as well. Um, then the health parameters need to be defined. So the infection to illness ratio, as well as the dailies per case. Also, there are some references available for those um, parameters. And then the number of Monte Carlo simulations need to be um, defined before the calculation can be started. Um, at the moment, on the Innovas platform, there's only Tapia output available as CSV or JSON file. Um, hopefully, the graphical output will be implemented later. And I will show now how a Kuma analysis can look like with the example of the Berlin mask scheme. So we are back at um, Berlin Spandau. And there the, the microbial analysis focuses on the subsurface as a hygienic parameter, as the hygienic barrier as it's most important with regard to the pathogen removal at the site. The calculation represents the worst case scenario, which means risks are over, rather overestimated than underestimated. And between the infiltration basin and the abstraction gallery, the Kumar A was conducted. And um, the log removal values were calculated between the infiltration basin and that observation bell, and then extrapolated for the whole aquifer passage. So the inflow concentrations were based on observed values and in thread log 10 uniform around the values. Um, I forgot that um, three pathogen groups um, were selected. So the bacteria, virus, and the protozoa for the analysis. The log reduction values were delineated from the hydraulic residence time between the infiltration basin and the observation well. And um, for this, the developed groundwater residence time tool was used and uh, hydraulic residence time of eight days was calculated using the input and output temperature signals. And with that um, hydraulic residence time, the temporal removal rates um, were calculated from the measured E. coli in the infiltration basin and the observation well. They were fitted to zero inflated negative binomial distribution. And from that, the median log removal value was calculated and for E. coli to be 2.1 log 10, which equals a median um, 
LRV of 0.263 log 10 per day. And that value was used to calculate the concentration at a specific time using the first order process. And the log reduction value versus the hydraulic residence time was able to be calculated from that. So also um, now the microbial risk or the log removal value at various residence time um, were able to be calculated. Um, yeah. So I just showed the site-specific evaluation of the log removal values. Unfotunately, for the virus and the protozoa, um, no measurements were available. So they were adapted from a Richard site in the Netherlands for the virus and from a bank filtration site in USA for the protozoa. Um, yeah, as exposure, the volume of ingested water was estimated to be one to three liters per day with a mode of two liters per day. Um, and it was assumed in an everyday consumption, meaning 365 days per year. As um, the dose response models were taken from the literature, and from the Kuma R wiki. So they were determined by the authors in their laboratory and were taken for this analysis here. And for the burden of disease and the ratio of infection to illness, it was assumed that R E. coli are pathogenic which is, of course, again, a worst case assumption is only some E. coli cause really illness or are pathogenic. Um, for E. coli, the ratio of illness to infection was 0 0.25, which means out of four infected, um, one gets ill. And the disease burden per case is 0 0.0547 which means that um, um, which equals about 20 days. Um, let's have a look at the results of the analysis. Here you can see the medium log reduction values for the three pathogen group, depending on the hydraulic residence time. And um, the daily versus the hydraulic residence time. As I already mentioned in the introduction, the WHO set an acceptable human health disease burden for dailies at, um, that is smaller than 10 to the power of minus six dailies, which means no more than one healthy life here in a group of one million people exposed is lost. If we have a look at the hydraulic residence time of 50 days, which is the minimum residence time required in Germany, um, you can see that um, for all pathogen group, um, that value is reached. If you have a look, for example, at only 40 days residence time, you can see that for viruses, um, that value is not reached. So there's a higher risk there if the residence time is about 40 days. And another measure to have a look at is the, um, the infected person or the infection probability. So the number of infected people per year. And there um, an acceptable measure is that it's smaller than 10 to the power of minus four, which means that no more than one person out of a group of 10,000 persons per year is infected. And as you can see here for a hydraulic residence time of 50 days, um, that value is again um, met for all three pathogen groups analyzed at Berlin Spandau. 
Um, to sum up, the interactive web-based Kuma tool provides a transparent way of examining microbial health risk where the assumptions, the underlying data and the calculation routine are comprehensively shown. It supports the evidence-based risk assessment to minimize water-related infectious diseases. And for Berlin Spandau, the subsurface passage is capable in reducing pathogens, essentially depending on the hydraulic residence time as shown. Also, the subsurface passage is cap comparable to high performance technical treatment systems, for example, reverse osmosis when it comes to pathogen removal. Um, Kuma will play a more important role in the future as the EU drinking water directed notes this, that risk assessment and risk management of catchment areas of abstraction points of water intended for human consumption are to be carried out by 2027, the latest. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, the, my colleagues from the smart control project team, especially Christoph Spenger, who did most of the analysis um, at the Berlin Spandau um, Mars site. And I would like also to turn your attention to the next online seminar. So there will be the, in May, there will be the seminar on real-time monitoring where the connection of online sensors to the Innovas platform and the processing of monitoring data is the main topic. And the third online seminar will deal with groundwater modeling and scenario analysis. So how can groundwater models be set up, run, the results evaluated and scenarios analyzed on the web-based Innovas platform? all with respect to manage aquifer recharge.